There is a pretty large public out there that is just waiting for us to stand up. And I think the COVID period just showed that courage is the single most lacking virtue of our time. That would be my appeal. Thanks. Professor, Professor Schippers, may I ask you some questions? Yes, of course. What do you want to know, Rico? What do you think is wrong with Dutch higher education with regards to free speech? My name is Rico Brouwer. Welcome to Follow the Science. Uh, in this report, we will see clips taken from an event hosted March 3rd, 2023 in the Netherlands on free speech, organized by Laurens Buys. And I, I'm uh, guessing you're home. Yes, you are welcome. Thanks for, uh, for, uh, for having us. Yeah, of course. Um, how would you summarize what happened at that event, your lead in to this, to this interview? Um, I think it was a very unique event in which scientists, teachers from colleges and universities all over Holland so it sort of came out and found um, yeah, safety and recognition in each other. And where for the first time, I think, in a long time, we together as colleagues could speak freely about our concerns about freedom of speech. Okay, cool. So it was filmed. Yeah. Uh, we had it filmed. And um, I've taken uh, uh, 10 clips from that thing and we'll, I'll show them to you and ask you to reflect on them. Yeah. So here's the first one. Okay, so thank you so much for being here all. And uh, welcome to this event about uh, free speech and free thought in Dutch higher education. This is what we'll be talking about today. I organized it because I'm very worried and not only because of my own experience as a whistleblower in the University of Amsterdam, but also because I see what's happening in the world, not only in the Netherlands. You had not intended to be there, which is like a, a bar setting or a cafe setting. Mm -hmm. Where did you first organize this event? I organized it at the University of Amsterdam in one of their buildings in the city center of Amsterdam. Okay, so the University of Amsterdam cancelled that event. That's yeah. also what's in this next clip. I'm proud to organize this event despite the university's bizarre, the university's bizarre decision to cancel the event, the location in the University of Amsterdam. They pressured me to cancel this event and they pushed through despite my attempts to stick to the location. I had support of the faculty. There was no clear argumentation as to why it should be canceled, but they pushed it through. We have over 30 colleagues, students, activists, entrepreneurs, people who are involved with free education and fr fr free minds, free thoughts, free speech in our educational institution. So I was not there. Uh, I was abroad, uh, it was a week ago, Friday a week ago, so it's exactly a week later. Do you now know, have you been talking to UFA, University of Amsterdam, about why did they cancel this? Not really. So they gave some arguments, but not convincing. So they said it, it was a safety hazard. They said this could undermine independent research uh, that is now going on, on uh, uh, about my whistleblower report. So they gave some arguments, but it's not... Yeah, it's not convincing because uh, there was no clue that safety was at stake. And there was many events at the UFA at this moment, also about me and about the whistleblower case. So this was a specific attack on my event. And that's also, you had to self-organize, that's what you did. I had to self-organize. I had to switch, I had to call people in my network and I found a space in the city of Amsterdam only two blocks away. So I was lucky that within an hour I had an alternative location. Okay, good for you. Okay, so what I always do in uh, um, situations like this, in interviews like this, uh, I was, uh, I'd be happy to invite them and to talk about this and talk about what happened and hear their side of this uh, story. Especially now that we have the film recordings also. So what was so dangerous about that thing? What was not safe? Uh, yeah. So feel free to ref uh, reflect and reach out yeah. and then uh, we continue this conversation. Okay, present there was also Michaela Schippers, well, whom, whom you know and uh, whom I create Follow the Science with, it's her podcast. Um, here's a part of what she had to say, starting off explaining what the Great Citizens Institute is all about. This is her initiative. Thank you. Well... <laughs> 
the Great Citizens Institute is um, something I do on a personal title. Uh, I'm a professor at Erasmus University in Rotterdam, but this is, uh, I always have to uh, say that it is on a personal note. Welcome to this forbidden event. Um, and it's a bit paradoxical because it's about free speech and for, to me also about academic freedom. Um, and so it was something that I really didn't think I would have to go through in my lifetime. And um, some people really innocently asked me if it's a good idea to get associated with uh, Lodens at this moment. Uh, because he's being cancelled and you can follow that in real time on Twitter, I suppose. And so my answer was, yes, it is. It's a very good idea, actually. Um, maybe for me personally it isn't, but in general it is. Because if we don't stand up for freedom, who is going to do it? If I don't do it, and even if I were the only one in the world, I would still do this. And even if it would cost me dearly, and it will probably cost me dearly. And I already realized that in 2020, I made this conscious decision to stand up and to speak. But speaking should be free. And we should defend the um, right to do so. Um, and to, f to use a variant of a famous quote, even if I disapprove of what you say, I will defend to the death your right to say it. And yeah, friends of Voltaire, right. So we cannot really be free if we cannot speak freely. So what I want you to do and invite you is to help each other and today think about a way how to escape the situation. Because if everybody uh, agrees or uh, does is, is afraid for jobs, for livelihood, for everything that we c should and, and, and can be afraid of, um, we will lose this livelihood anyway. So I will invite you to stand up and make a safe cordon around Laurens today if you feel like it. So I will stand by him now. And if you agree, let's all stand together. Thank you. And let's today decide on how to become free and how to make sure, for instance, there's the Brownstone Institute and the Brownstone Institute is, is also uh, making sure that there is a sanctuary. Why do we need as scientists a sanctuary? If science isn't free anymore, what is freedom? What does freedom mean? So I would suggest, and we can talk about that later, of course, to, to make sure that we have an institute that is really free. Can we do that? Um, and I need help of everyone. I, uh, we cannot do that alone. So uh, let's talk about that today. So much, Michaela. She called it a forbidden event, and she spoke of dangers of being associated with you. Yeah. So watching this, I can imagine people going, well, is that you're being overly dra dramatic. Yeah. You're in a bar, it's all free, there's no yeah. police there, you're yeah. free to associate and talk with with Lauren, so how would you re reflect to that? Well, this was very emotional to me because I experienced a psychological field, eh, especially at the University of Amsterdam, about things you can say and not say. I have been put in a corner of being a wrong person. And it's now people, it's really literally what she says, people that associate with me can get in trouble. They can get canceled, their career can get in trouble. Uh, they can get in trouble in their teams. So the colleagues that I still meet of the University of Amsterdam, I meet secretly at this moment in restaurants and bars far away from the campus uh, through app out of fear that the university might also read our work email. So this to me was so true and so the heart of the, 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 the core of the message actually. And that is that we have to overcome our fear, speak out and make sure that people who do speak out don't get isolated. That worked. It was a nice yeah. symbolic situation there with people standing up in, yeah. in a protective circle around you. Yeah. Okay. Um, she suggests a really free institute. I'm quoting here. So do you know what that's about? You mean uh, the, the Great Citizens Institute? Yeah. Well, I, I'm, it's, it's, that's what she's saying here uh, yeah. at the event. Yeah. Well, so I think that she promotes um, 
hè, wat, wat Michaela embodies to me and also her initiative of the Great Citizens Institute is a new science that is more open, uh, that dares to speak out also about very um, yeah, touchy and sensitive topics of this time, but it is also more empathetic and that is more open with a heart, more human. Eh? Because I think our universities have become machines of logic, neoliberal production f uh, factories. Mm -hmm. And this is also what for me the Great Citizen Institute and also Michael embodies, a new science where we think that we have to work towards. Yeah, is it in existence then, or are, are we starting that? How does that work, you know? Yeah, it is, uh, we have to start it. And it's the, the universities that we have now are not catering this. Eh? So what we see is a continuing narrowing of what science is or should be. And it's more and more focused on production, more and more focused on the interests of the elite. And I think we really need to free our scientific institutions. Okay. Okay, what you don't hear really well in, in the recording that we made is, is the audience. So there was a microphone passed around, so the speakers are very, you, you can hear them very well, but not the apl applause that sometimes uh, takes place. So that may, may set, uh, uh, strike you a bit odd in how that sounds. But the microphone was passed around, and here's what some of the people there uh, had to say, what they contrib contributed. Um, before they started, you asked them, Please keep it brief because there's many people in this room and we want to, everybody who wants to volunteer their opinion, we want to give them a chance. So how many people were there then? Uh, there were around 40 people. Yeah, okay. I have uh, created some clips of some of the speakers and we're going to see oh, you yeah. the first one. My name is uh, Maria Louise Genet and um, I used to be a teacher at the University of Amsterdam. But I got into a lot of trouble for speaking out. I got six gagging orders or the, uh, by my um, <clears throat> colleagues or um, my uh, room members uh, and even people in, uh, in power in the university. And I'm still shocked about everything that uh, has been going on. It's a horrible place uh, about Corona issues, but well, I think it's much bigger. It's all about Agenda 2030 and transhumanism and whether you want that or not. Uh, and you're not allowed to speak out against it. It's uh, all the climate uh, nonsense, the, the nitrogen, the stickstoff, uh, corona, uh, vax mandates, the woke uh, indoctrination that's going uh, way too uh, far. Uh, yeah, so I see a lot of problems and I've been uh, presenting at Café Weltsmerz about uh, 50 episodes or something like that which was not uh, <laughs> liked by the university. So I lost my job. So uh, just before my masters, I quit again because I, I said, I don't want to become a part of that sect or cult. And I'm happy uh, I, I, I quit from the university. And one of the things what struck me in, uh, in the University of uh, Delft and at Amsterdam, there was ne <laughs> never, a, never a personal contact with the teachers. So mm -hmm. you were just, uh, you just had to follow what they said, but there was never a one-to-one -one personal contact with, uh, with each other. Hi everyone, this is Reem. Um, okay, not sure where to begin. Uh, well, perhaps it's important to begin uh, in the place where I actually was born and grew up, which is a factual totalitarian regime that psychologically actually feels no difference from the Netherlands or Canada, and that is Syria. The only practical difference is that actually there you will be slaughtered and tortured to death while everybody else in silence watches, including the world. I think if I leave this room with two things I want you to contemplate, there are two words. One is arrogance, and the other is ignorance. Let's begin with the latter, ignorance. You need to learn your own history to realize that this is not a new phenomena. Read Orwell's preface to Animal Farm, and you know what that means. Now, the prior is arrogance. Europeans were no different from the rest of the world when they ba basically were about to slaughter each other and the rest of the globe. 
we both know the two instances in human history that almost got us all wiped. It is arrogant to think that this will not occur again. It is arrogant to think that what's happening today at UFA or other institutions is just a new phenomena that is just wokeism. It is much, much deeper problem. Once we begin with those two understandings, we have hope. I think the Netherlands still has a chance to not get to where Syria is today. And it's not an alarmist thing. It's a factual reality that has been true before and it will continue to be true. We stand up for freedom by being free. That's the only way. Thank you. We first saw Maria Luisa and then Bart, <coughs> who underwrote what you just said about the personal contact yeah. at universities. Yeah. And also said it, it's more broad than just the one you are working for, University yeah. of Amsterdam, it's all over the place. Yeah. The, uh, then um, this third speaker, a, a lady from Syria, says the people in Syria now only have a totalitarian re uh, system, but we in the Netherlands have hope. You have hope or you would not be organizing this event, I, yes. I would yeah. think. Yeah. So what do you hope to achieve? <clears throat> well, for me, I hope um, to um, promote courage. I think courage is very important. Um, we have to break the silence. Eh? We have to expose it, what's going on. We have to just name it. That's also what I like so much about the clip. And how it started with the Maria Louise Jeanette, my colleague from the Faculty of Law, who just bravely started to talk about issues that are normally and at the university circles disregarded as conspiracy theory. So we have to speak openly and freely in our concerns and just speak freely about we are afraid of totalitarianism, we are afraid of authoritarian agendas being rolled out in our universities, in our educational institutions that present themselves as morally good and just and pro-climate, pro-diversity, uh, who can be against that? Okay. Uh, but still, we have to be brave uh, to point at the, the suppressive agenda behind it. All right, so empowerment. It's empowerment, yeah. And I think the, the, the courage and to be brave, we can only do that together. Uh, so like me, I also, the only reason I still can stand up after my whistleblower uh, report in the University of Amsterdam is because of the massive support I get. So we really need to do this together. Okay, it wasn't just one person from abroad, with all, all do you re respect this lady from Syria. Here's uh, Nicholas from Canada. My name is Nicholas. I'm uh, originally from Canada. Uh, I have nothing to do with Dutch education at the moment. Um, but I came here to the Netherlands as a sort of a cultural refugee, uh, maybe a misuse of the word refugee, but basically to get away from um, what we have in Canada now, which is a dogma of not offending. And that obviously comes out of a university and government policy around um, the pluralistic society, but uh, it manifest now in everyday society between people, uh, within families, um, at every level of society where basically nothing can be discussed, especially nothing of any kind of controversy, never mind even the, uh, the simplest uh, news item or uh, topic that might offend someone from some uh, group or other. Um, so all I can say is that I'm coming from a place where basically this policy has advanced to the degree where it's uh, in every individual. And here in the Netherlands, I see it's, it's far, far better. So you're just beginning down the road towards what we have now in North America. And you can see it in the US more clearly in the media, but uh, it's the exact same trajectory. So for me, this whole time is more like the spiritual emptiness, I feel, you know, uh, in people, around people, uh, us as a society. And when Nietzsche said, okay, um, uh, God is dead, um, he also warned us, you know, he said, okay, then we have basically two things. 
it's nihilism and uh, maybe hedonism, but it both leads to totalitarianism. So uh, this is also like for me a spiritual war. Michel Moll, and before I be was programmer here and uh, uh, futurist management consultant, I was at uh, the National Public Broadcaster, director of innovation there for 10 years, where I was a fighter for freedom of speech, freedom of discourse. To give you an example, um, I helped with uh, Rutger Wees and Marianne Swagerman to get Omroep pwned into the broadcasting system while I'm actually quite a leftist guy. Mm -hmm. And like Marianne said, uh, when we were presenting here, this left wing and right wing types together, we're just concerned with one thing, pluriformity of the voice. And also I worked with the Council of Europe for a long while to get former East European broadcasters to transform from state-owned um, state monopoly media to more pluriform discourse. And it hurts me very much to see, and I, like some said, can't actually believe what's going on here today. So um, these are just some clips of an event that lasted over more than two hours. Um, uh, a a two-hour-long debate on free speech. Now people talking about Syria, about Canada, and Michel talking about the Dutch state. Maybe you would reflect on the state aspect of what's being said there by these people. We know you as a whistleblower from University of Amsterdam, so that's yeah. a university aspect. Is it more than that? Is it the state thing also? Yeah, I think it was so touching about this event that people from Syria and Canada who had experienced severe suppression and authoritarian rule there, especially of course in Syria, but also Canada eh, since COVID, very authoritarian approach to COVID, that they actually came here to Amsterdam expecting to find freedom but in fact landing in the same dynamic that these people that know very severe oppression recognize the same dynamic here in Amsterdam and in the Netherlands but also at the university I think this should wake us up yeah that's I think a very important uh, discovery well they should recognize it before anybody else because they had seen it firsthand already yeah and this is why we should wake up that if these people that know how bad things can get and that come from countries that are further uh, ahead of us, that we should be warned. And yes, I think it's clearly also a nation state issue. Uh, I think that we see here in Holland is that uh, with the, the neoliberalism that is sort of determines now the dynamics in the universities is for a large part rolled out by national politicians and national policies that in, they in turn come from international uh, global institutions like the European Union, the World Economic Forum, etc. Okay, so it's even bigger than that. Okay, yeah. let's, let's look at another couple of speakers. And when I came uh, to be a university teacher, I got uh, a lot of discussion about Russia is not the bad guy that you are thinking about. Uh, there are more bad guys. Russia is doing what it is doing uh, it's pursuing its national interest or that uh, Wahhabis uh, are um, uh, terrorists and if you use uh, the word Wahhabis and uh, the other people without any any um, uh, uh, nuancation and qualification think uh, that uh, I am uh, disrespecting all of the Muslims which itself is a disrespect to all of the Muslims uh, or uh, think that uh, I was a very, uh, uh, yeah, very uh, uh, angry about that uh, was that uh, there were people at the University of Amsterdam who were cooperating with the Iran with part of Iranian regime, and I was against that. So uh, to put it short, uh, I uh, um, I left uh, academia in the Netherlands and uh, went to uh, foreign countries, and I am now full professor in one of those bad, baddy uh, Soviet uh, countries, and I'm happy about that. People were sharing experiences about being cancelled for keeping an open mind to states like Russia or ethnic groups like with the Wahhabi Muslim community. Mm -hmm. My question to you, and this is your expertise as a, as a, as a, as a, as a teacher mm -hmm. at university, I would think, mm -hmm. does the hatred for certain ethnic groups or countries stem from what we just discussed, like state actors? Is it, has it always been like this mm -hmm. or where does it come from? 
Now, I think we are, we are witnessing very severe polarization throughout the Western world and actually throughout the world, where more and more oppositions are being, uh, yeah, getting more extreme, polarized. And, um, and this dynamic is very clearly part of, um, yeah, sort of the authoritarian and totalitarian zeitgeist. Eh? So towards, when, when we get closer towards a totalitarian regime, you always see more polarization. The question is, where does it stem from? Eh? I think it's, uh, we can at least say that it is clearly in the interests of the world elites to have polarization because of the classical principle divide and conquer. Eh? So division is also a way for us not to unite in our common interest against the global elite. So is it, yeah, this is speculation, but is it intentional then or is it just a sign of the times? Yeah, so it's always, I think, both. It's a bottom-up dynamic, it's part of the times, and it's also being nudged, I think, and being steered and being okay. sort of, uh, yeah, getting, it's, it's promoted in a way by, by international, global interests that translate through nation states. Thank you for that. You had students and teachers from many Dutch universities on your event and from abroad uh, present. How did you go about uh, inviting them? So it, it was all last minute and you have a room full of people that, that have, well, they're well spoken. Yeah. So how did you reach out to them and how did you select them or how did that come about? So since I came out as a whistleblower of woke extremism at the University of Amsterdam, I got a lot of support throughout the country, also from students and employees of colleges and universities in Holland. So what I did is I sent them an email two weeks before this event, inviting them over and also inviting them to invite people from their network. Mm -hmm. And also I put it on my website, social media, and this is why it actually got a quite big exposure. Okay. Okay. One of the events attending people was former University of Groningen teacher, uh, Cheert Anninga. He tried teaching his students, in my words, so I reflect on that, to think critically for themselves. That was his, that was his, the training he gave them, critical thinking. <laughs> and um, he also used non-mainstream sources in his material. He got fired for it. Did I summarize it? You summarized it perfectly well. Eh? So Thierry Andringa, I think, a fantastic colleague of mine from the University of Groningen, who designed his own course for students after 20 years of loyal service and being a fantastic natural scientist. He specialized in audio and sound. And he then got a course with more freedom. It's called a system view on life in which he would train students to think clearly. He, what he would do is he would hand them academic sources, but also alternative sources that are often seen as fake news or conspiracy. And he promoted students to make autonomous decisions about what do I want with this knowledge and can I integrate it? Can I shift it? Can I get something out of it that is useful to me or my system view on life? And he got fired for that eh? on the accusation of promoting conspiracy theorists. He was first stigmatized as the conspiracy professor and then he got fired. Here's Stuart. My name is Stuart Anderinga. I am recently cancelled at the University of Groningen. Um, hmm? Yeah. Um, I'm fired. Yes, actually, I'm free for two days now. Yeah, and um, uh, so I want to uh, to say a few things because my situation is actually pretty uh, okay. In 2013, I wrote a paper uh, on uh, the psychological drivers of bureaucracy, in which I described the process that actually happened to me. Uh, now it is called it is known as cancelling, but I, I described that in that paper. So at some point, I saw everything uh, setting up for me to be cancelled. And that moment, I changed my colleagues into subjects that I studied. So I studied the whole uh, psychology of cancelling, and I did it in great detail. Um, and I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm interested in, in stories about how it happened uh, to, 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 to you. So please come to me and then we have an interview. Um, but so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I know now the theory of uh, the psychological drivers of cancelers. And it has everything to do with uh, bureaucracy. Um, so in the end, I, I, I went through the whole process, uh, got my reputation uh, ruined, etc. 
Um, and now I am uh, unemployed and I'm completely unemployable and everyone knows that. So I, I'm actually in a pretty comfortable situation. Uh, um, so, so André Ga used material in his lessons that was not approved. The event was about freedom of speech. How free are university teachers today to base their teachings on their own teaching material? Um, less and less free to do so. There's more and more pressure from all sides to say certain things, to adapt uh, your, your courses to interest of the faculty or the university, often not, on, not on very explicit, but more subtle. So it's a, a very problematic development. And um, there's also hope. What I see in the University of Amsterdam is extreme local differences. So it also still depends very much on who is the dean of your faculty, who is the director of your educational um, department. So there is very strong local differences. There are still bubbles, a lot of bubbles of freedom. But what I also see is that the bubbles where, where the institution dictates more and more, that these are growing. Hello. Um. <laughs> Do, do I need this? No. Yes, Can you just... Oh, okay, okay. Hi, okay. Uh, my name is Bas van Bommel. I am a university lecturer uh, at uh, Utrecht University. Um, my um, field is literature, the history of literature, especially classics, Greek and Roman literature. Um, like, I think, uh, Laurens, uh, as you mentioned, uh, COVID, the COVID period really opened my eyes to the real problem. Um, the totalitarian mindset you spoke about um, really materialized during COVID for the very first time in a way that no one could escape it. Um, that was really new. That's why I'm even grateful for the COVID period to open my eyes. And that really happened. Um, um, as far as your question is concerned, what's wrong with uh, academic uh, freedom? I would say um, 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 in many ways, there is a lot of academic freedom. There are many, many topics that you can easily uh, disagree about. Uh, you can um, uh, freely exchange views on the nature of the French Revolution, the nature of human free will, or whether or not there has been a Big Bang. You can discuss that in all freedom. I would say there is only, um, I, I can only count seven kind of holy truths that you should not disagree with. I just, uh, perhaps there are more, but I will just briefly list them as far as uh, I see it. Firstly, there is, of course, the health issue, all the, the vaccine-related stuff about global health. Secondly, we have everything related to gender, uh, gender equality, uh, transgenderism, and so on. Then we have the climate problem. Then we have the nitrogen discussion. Then very important in my field is Western history, which of course is only about the patriarchy and slavery. That is the fifth holy um, uh, truth. Um, sec uh, sixthly, um, I think everything what has to do with the, e the EU and immigration. Um, and last but not least, the Russian Putin Ukraine war. There's only one allowed narrative on that. Um, these are kind of the seven holy truths of the new transhumanist religion. I would say it's really valuable to look upon it as a religion because it's characteristic of religions that you can be free in all kind of respects, except for the seven holy truths, which of course happen to be the seven most pressing issues of our age. So it is very, very worrying that those are, uh, and in these fields, there is just no zero academic freedom. There is just none. So I wasn't there and I watched the whole recording over two hours and I got the feeling like this is like in the, in the old days, this is, this is where religion is banned. You, you secretly close the curtains and then profess your religion and, and be your church in the attic or what have you. Yeah. One of the speakers then also called your venue a hidden church yeah. um, where people would go underground to profess their religion. Now. Let's reflect on that. If it has, does it have religious traits? And if it does, is it still a scientific event or an event on education? Do you mean the resistance or the, the what happens in the, the university? Uh, yeah, both. You, uh, you. So let's look at this group of people in this yeah. in this church-like setting yeah. as as the resistance. Yeah. They strike me similar to people professing a religion that's that's not allowed, mm -hmm. and also the attacks yeah. on them has religious virtues. Yeah. I, 
I see that as well. And I think in that sense, it was also very symbolic that the university banned the event and that we had to go to this uh, sort of, um, yeah, hidden place that we also were not allowed to share the location before. What would have happened if you shared the location? Then? Yeah, then the, the, the event venue could get in trouble. Exactly like in the past, where certain religious minorities could not exist in certain places in Europe, uh, and that we now have the same issues here in Amsterdam. Yeah. Okay. Let's carry on. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter. Um, I'm with uh, Rotterdam University of Applied Sciences and just moved up the ladder a little bit. Um, so I'm in a, in a position where I'm, as a research professor, um, responsible for keeping up academic freedom and academic discussion. Um, but it's not that what I want to talk about. I want to share with you an experience. Um, I was born and raised in Switzerland and did a PhD at the intersection of industrial engineering and industrial psychology. Now, Switzerland, beautiful country, um, neutral, the be most beautiful democracy, we believe, um, held in 1989 a massive national military parade in every city to celebrate World War II breaking out. To tell the story, because our army was so strong, Hitler didn't dare to attack us. Just six years later, 1995, the archives opened, and it was clear Switzerland was not attacked through it by Hitler because of its army. It wasn't attacked because of its banks. The story of Switzerland and the gold of the Jews. But we were told at school, we have this beautiful army. This shattered my belief in states. This shattered my belief in authorities. This shattered my belief in the educational system. So that uh, uh, was a surprise to me. So oh, all of a sudden we're talking about banks and the power of, of, of the financial system, hmm. which is one of the reasons that I became more of an activist after the, after the 2008 financial crisis. Mm -hmm. So on an event about freedom of education, mm -hmm. This is his question. Did this story about money and the power of bank resonates to this audience? It very much does, I would say, eh? because we all know, I think everybody who works at an um, university institution or higher educational institution has witnessed over the past 5, 10, 15 years more and more financialization. For example, the University of Amsterdam has outsourced all its financial projects with, to the Deutsche Bank. And this has severe consequences for how also local teams in my university are managed and how we are being uh, sort of graded and, 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 um, and paid. So um, I think the neoliberalization and the financialization and increasing grip of banks on universities is a very real thing at the moment. What are the odds that the one guy from Switzerland sits yeah. next to the next one? <laughs> exactly. Here's another clip from uh, someone. I saw from... it. <laughs> So what are the odds that the two Swiss people in this room sit next to each other? <laughs> so I'm, I'm a little bit of a fake Swiss because I got Swiss citizenship only one year ago. Uh, I, I am from Germany uh, and I used as a running joke that I'm a refugee from Germany. And I actually meant that serious. I left Germany because of its growing dysfunctionality and its growing, deeply entrenching intolerance towards principles of freedom. And people just kept on saying, but how, you know, Germany and, and all that. And it's like, uh, it's a failing state on the way towards being a failed state. And I don't want to be part of it. So I moved to Switzerland and became a Swiss citizen. I feel very lucky that I am in Switzerland. It's not perfect, uh, but among all the different places in the world, I would not want to be anywhere else but in Switzerland because there are some deeply entrenched freedoms that are better than in other countries. But still, also Switzerland is in danger. I want to 
I want to um, emphasize what Reem said earlier. Um, there is a line in the movie Holocaust, uh, this, this German TV drama, uh, American TV drama about the Jewish uh, Holocaust. And there this uh, Jewish lady, uh, when, when the film was playing in the year 1935, she was saying, I don't want to believe that the country of Schiller and Goethe and Beethoven would do these terrible things to me that they are threatening. And yet they did. The first step to acknowledging the world that we're in is to acknowledge that totalitarianism is the default setting of our world. That's where we are at per default. Not freedom is the default, totalitarianism is no default. Why? We've seen an impromptu event about Dutch higher education with regards to free speech. He was not so hopeful. He says, well, free speech, that's the, that's the anomaly. Mm -hmm. How would you respond to what he just said? I think it's a very, um, a very true remark. And it should wake us up yeah, that when human beings are in crisis mode and in panic mode and we act from fear, and then we start to focus on control mechanisms and we get top-down hierarchies. It's within us, it's triggered very easily. Yeah? So we have to work very hard to create institutions, organizations, social settings that are more horizontal, that leave space for individual thought, for individual speech, for individual freedom, and also still for uh, being a collective together. So this requires hard work. And this is the work that now our institutions also have to do eh, in higher education. What's your outlook? I think we are uh, in a deep crisis. I think if you want to know what will happen in Holland the coming years, you can look at the United States or Canada or Great Britain. I think freedom in our institutions and higher education are in great danger. And I think we really have to stand up, fight, have a plan, have a strategy, stop being silent, stop being complicit and be, courage, other, uh, be, be courageous. Otherwise we will lose freedom of education and then we will, then we will lose the, the younger generation and then freedom in society will just collapse. Eh? So free education is so important. Eh? Having freedom of thought, freedom of speech, eh? that nurture and nourish um, free minds is essential for a thriving society. Here's the last clip that I took from the event. Yeah. So I'd like to ask Mi Michaela, and I will also now share, and then you will be the last, and then we will have a break, and then we have enough time to do the, a second round. So I would just like to uh, share about what's wrong in my view with the universities. I think it's, uh, in my experience, it's a lack of empathy. Yeah? So in my educational institution, the University of Amsterdam, like the way I have been treated uh, already for a long time, but especially since I came out as a whistleblower, it feels like um, narcissistic abuse. It feels like, and I've experienced with that on a personal level, and now it happens to me um, on a, uh, shall I stand up? Is that what you mean? Oh yeah. So it happened to me on a personal level in my life, and now it happens on an institutional level. And it's for me maddening eh, to experience that. So I also experience a lot of emotions, eh, a lot of anger, especially a lot of anger, because that is what I have learned in my life to survive with narcissists is to sort of um, um, yeah use my anger eh? and listen to my anger and also the wisdom and to express my anger and what is happening at the University of Amsterdam is that my anger that is fully justified and that is my lifesaver is then shamed and then I am being seen as you're unreasonable and you are um, uh, derailed yeah so this is the trick that's been happening to me i have been scapegoated and then i stand up and come up for myself and then i'm being framed as uh, a bad person yeah so that for me the lack of empathy in educational institution the narcissistic abuse is the main problem 
Thank you. I'm, I'm really moved by all the stories that I hear. And um, my idea was also uh, autonomy needs to go back to the people, but we have to claim and reclaim autonomy. But that is maybe also for the second round. But I also see the psychology playing out. I'm a psychologist by training and I see everything in the textbook playing out in real life. And I was so shocked by that. And so when I started, I the first, I think one of the first people I approached, because usually when I publish, I don't write the authors of papers. And, and uh, but this time I, I called uh, uh, or I wrote Pierre Ederer because he wrote about the virus plays itself out after 70 days, or at least that was the conclusion. And that was the first thing I found. And I found the same thing from an, an uh, Israeli uh, former general who also told that on television and was debated heavily. And then I found out that there was no proof the measures worked. I'm like, what? And then I found out that the measures were even more uh, harmful than I knew before. And so I started publishing about this and then I tried to make it public and then nobody wanted to hear the story. So I had to go to the alternative press to, to do that. And then I was asked, why are you talking to this alternative uh, uh, media? And then I think, well, I can't, I can hardly say that I do this because I have to make this public. And uh, then they will say, say, of course, but it's not true what you're saying. So why, of course, uh, the only one who wants to hear you is the alternative media. So I, I slept on it. And I, then I said, well, I think the message in this case is more important than the medium. And um, so I could do this for a while. And then, of course, uh, the university didn't really like me uh, to do that. And I think a lot of people uh, had the same experience. But then I, I was like, what is going on on a, on a very high level? Because I always I published six papers in the meantime, co-published. What is going on on a high level? Then what's happening is that both the elite, there's going to be in a, a collapsing society. I noticed society is collapsing in different rates. And then there is an, a, diff, uh, a big... Um, how do you say, the gap between the elite and the masses. And both the elite and the masses will behave dysfunctionally. So this is something we need to address. And also this perpetrator-victim cycle is something that we need to address. So this is a very important uh, thing that we need to do in the second round, I think. <laughs> Maybe we can fix it. <laughs> All right, so um, this event went on for another hour. Uh, I took clips from the, from the part before the break. Um, clearly, it is also uh, a call to action. That's, that's one of the reasons that, that you did this. Uh, as a final question, I would ask, what do you have in store? Are there any follow-up events planned, uh, Laurens? Um, <clears throat> what would you have people do now they see this? And also, you, you mentioned anger. Would you have them be anger, angry or would you have them... How, how would you... Mm -hmm. uh, what's, what's your call to action? Yeah. I think so interesting about this last clip was basically that we talked about the psychology of totalitarianism, eh? both Michaela and me. And we know from the work of Matthias de Smet, who wrote this fantastic book called The Psychology of Totalitarianism, that there is this psychological aspect to it. So I think the call to action that I will say is to take note of the knowledge that we have of the totalitarian mindset and to break through it. How do we do that? Be courageous. Speak out, always speak out, never be quiet, no matter how much pressure, but speak out because there is the freedom in speaking. Um, and also um, stand together, unite. And um, I think very importantly in breaking this psychology of totalitarianism is dare to be angry. Dare to be angry, use your anger because there's wisdom and power in anger. Often anger is shamed, especially in totalitarian cultures. You're seen as aggressive or unreasonable, but anger is crucial in finding the energy, the wisdom to stand up. So these would be, this is my call to action. What I did is I formed an online network after this event with all the people who were there. I put on my website, launusbuis.org, how you can join this online platform of people uh, joining together online from all over the world who are concerned about freedom and higher education. So I invite people to come together also on this online platform and to talk more and to think through strategic actions. Laurens Buys, thank you very much. You're welcome.